Okay, folks, we might get going. We have people continuing to join, uh, but um, what we'll be able to tell people is if they come in late, this will be available as a webinar viewable on YouTube and also on Yuku in Chinese, or in China, I should say, which is the commonly used platform in China. And it'll be available as a podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google, and we're looking for other places as well. Thank you everyone for joining us today on this webinar on land use, or at least how we've addressed that within the European Union Taxonomy on Sustainable Finance. This is part of a series of taxonomies we're doing, the taxonomy webinars we're doing. Every Thursday at 1500 CEST, there will be a webinar on this topic for the coming six weeks and possibly longer, depending on how, much lock, how long lockdown goes in different countries. The past webinars are already available at climatebonds.net slash webinars. And you'll find a link to podcast that appears there in the next couple of days. We are in interesting times, in the middle of a significant crisis, a crisis which uh, we've been warned by our climate scientists is something we need to get used to for the 21st century. With the nature of climate change, even in a sub two degree world, which doesn't look that likely at the moment, but that is our clear objective, uh, we will still see significant climate impacts, which will lead to volatility of weather, storms, heat incidences across Europe or China or other countries, uh, fires such as Australia experienced at Christmas, these will become more frequent. Typhoons in the uh, South China Sea will be th up to three times more intense than they've been in the past. But also with the stress on our ecosystems, we are likely to see more pathogens crossing over to our species. There's already been much discussion online by climate scientists about the origins of the particular pathogen that we're experiencing now and its potential link to degradation of, of environments. Uh, we need to get used to a century of shocks. We need to learn from this particular crisis what we need to do. Yes, we have to deepen the resilience of our health systems so we can chat, deal with things like this when they happen again, whether that's extreme storms or whether it's another pandemic and we will have more pandemics. The IPCC Health Committee has made that very clear to us in over the last 30 years. We also need to be looking at other social protection measures and understanding the link to resilience. When we have these shocks, we've got to be able to lift the poor and support the poor quickly. It can't afford to take too long. Otherwise, we will see imploded and degraded societies, not just ecosystems. That's the big risk for the 21st century. Syria is everywhere unless we act to ensure globally that we address the question of resilience. The taxonomy, of course, is essentially a procurement plan for the Paris Agreement. It needs to be seen as a framework for stimulus investments that also help reduce the risk of forward shocks by lessening the risk of extreme climate change. That's a really critically important thing for us to wrestle with. So we're going to talk today about the land use provisions of the EU taxonomy and their link towards addressing future risk, in particular around mitigation. We will also have a little bit of a conversation about the adaptation and resilience issues in relation to land use, but I want to refer you to a session we're going to do in this Thursday 1500 series in May on adaptation and resilience, where you will hear Anna Creed is on the call today, talking again in depth about that particular topic and implications for our understanding of the sustainable taxonomy. Today, let me welcome Anna Creed, who's the head of standards at the Climate Bonds Initiative, who has been leading the agriculture work group for the technical expert group on sustainable finance, and also Elodie Feller from the United Nations Environment Programs Finance Initiative, who's been leading within the technical expert group, the forestry work. I'm going to ask Anna to kick us off with key high or highlights of the agricultural criteria. We'll talk a little bit about that. LED will then talk about the forestry stuff and we will keep this conversational. We'll chop and change a bit, which means ask questions on the Q&A as we go. And we will attempt to pick up those questions as much as we're able. 
Elodie and Anna can see those Q&A questions as well, although they might be preoccupied of what they're saying. I'll monitor. We'll see what we can pick up. And remember, we will attempt to pick up questions we haven't uh, addressed during this webinar at a later stage as well. We won't lose these things. So first, uh, Anna, I'm going to now shift to the next PowerPoint. Tell us a little bit, and I've lost a few words there, but you'll get the idea. Um, tell us a little bit about what we're doing and why we're doing this in the agriculture sector, just to get us going, what we're trying to achieve here. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, and good afternoon, everybody, or good morning. Um, very nice to be with you all today. Um, so yeah, so LED and I co-chaired the work on agriculture um, for the the tech group so um, but I'm going to talk about it today and Ellen is going to focus on the forestry basically agriculture is was picked up as one of the sectors um, with the high potential for a substantial contribution to mitigation which was the kind of selection criteria for the prioritization um, of sectors and activities within the tech Ag agriculture is obviously a very interesting sector because yes it's a source of high emissions at the moment around about 20 percent globally maybe 10 percent of emissions um, in the EU are allocated to agriculture. Um, so there's obviously potential for significant mitigation there, but also it has the potential to sequester or store carbon. And we really want to maximize that as well, not just to reduce the emissions, but to really be maximizing uh, the stocking and the storage of carbon in the uh, biomass and soils in the agricultural sector. Um, so in essence, the, the scope of the agricultural criteria cover croplands and livestock. Um, so we've got perennial, it's, this is because it's separated out in the NACE codes in this way. We've got perennial crop production and non Sorry, NACE codes. NACE codes are the industry categorization system used in the European Union. And we've attempted to map all activities to those to make it easier for businesses to understand what's in and what's out and to find them. Just to explanation, always need to add that in, Anna, especially for yeah. our international viewers, listeners. Great, thank you. Yep, so we've got perennial crops, which in essence are sort of tree-based crops, and non-perennial crops, which are all the others, cereal, rice, uh, vegetables, etc., etc. And livestock covers all different types of livestock, cattle, um, poultry, pigs, sheep, goats, etc., etc. So it's a pretty broad remit here, which what isn't on this list, but what we actually see and practice a lot in agriculture is mixed farms that have a combination of these activities going on. The criteria also, and the taxonomy can also cover mixed farms. It would work on a kind of mix and match basis. The part of the farm that is dedicated to crop production, you'd use the crop criteria. The part that's for livestock, you'd use livestock criteria. And similarly, if you've got a mix of perennials and non-perennials on your farm. So it, they, it should be able to be covering quite a lot of different agricultural setup, uh, setups on different farms uh, through these three categories. And then on the next slide, we've got... But, but it's interesting that you... Can I ask you, Anna? Yeah. You've included livestock. And this is a controversial area among some groups. Tell us a little bit about the thinking behind that. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, we even we had some quite lively discussions, even the agricultural subgroup about whether we should include livestock or not. Um, obviously, some some particularly some subsectors in the livestock sector can be very high emissions, are very high emissions, cattle in particular. Um, we decided uh, on balance to keep livestock in at this stage, or at least the tags recommendations for the taxonomy, on the basis that it is high emissions, but there is also substantial potential to reduce those emissions in the short term and doing so doesn't lock us in to keeping livestock over the longer term. Um, so we wanted to keep it in to maximise um, that uh, substantial contribution to mitigation potential. Obviously over time it will be interesting to see what transition pathways look like for agriculture. It's a bit hazy and unknown at the moment, you know, how agriculture will shift over time um, and that and part of that is kind of societal and cultural shifts away from eating meat as well. So at the moment, livestock is in. Um, we've made recommendations to these, the sustainable finance platform, which will take on the work of developing and maintaining the taxonomy after the TEG um, has effectively now handed over our recommendations to monitor this situation, to consider um, the ongoing status of livestock within the taxonomy, particularly as at the moment, we don't differentiate in the criteria between different types of livestock. And it might be the case in the future that you might want to do that. So some types of livestock have a, uh, a clearer argument than others for being higher or lower emissions, and it might reflect that in the future. But for now, we've got it in because it, there, there is potential for substantial mitigation in the sector. And that, now and this is a critical the, conceptual yeah. point here. So, you know, we, we, we of course have some debate about how we should have no meat. 
uh, as part of our diet to this. And there's many areas where ideally we would shift to a very low carbon position. But what we're saying is the critical thing is to get emissions down from where they are now as rapidly as possible. We're not going to actually stop livestock production in the short term. There's still uncertainty about what the end point is that, of that is. You know, there's all sorts of talks about some landscapes where um, animals can actually serve a carbon retention function of soils. It's complicated, but we want to drive the industry. So we're putting a relatively strong level of ambition and it's seen as a transition. And this will be continually reviewed. I think we're saying the taxonomy every five years. Is that going to be the case in agriculture with livestock too? Is that how you see it? That's the recommendation that the TEG effectively we made to the platform to keep this under review and okay. see over time as the science changes. Yeah. Okay, so in many, in many areas for our listeners of the taxonomy, we've identified uh, clear investments that are 2050 consistent, let's say, like solar and wind, we say. We've identified enabling investments, which might be uh, grid investments or manufacturing of triple glaze windows, which we see as important to recognise and support. And then we've identified transition investments. These are sectors that will change over the next 30 years. We need to drive that change, ensure that the ambition is adequate as distinct from freeze them out entirely. And in this case, we've included livestock in that particular uh, aspect. There's more discussion we can have about this, of course, but uh, and there might be some questions. Thank you, Anna. I'll take you to the next slide, which you want to dive into. Great, thank you. Um, so this is a high level summary of the criteria. It's the same structure uh, for all of those three categories, perennial, non-perennial crops and livestock. There's effectively three objectives and a corresponding criteria for each of those three objectives. The first one is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, from ongoing um, land or animal management. The second one is to really maintain and increase uh, existing carbon stocks in biomass and in soils. And the third one is to, so those first two are really about ongoing land use. The third one is about not converting high carbon stock land like forests or peatland, something like that, for agricultural purposes in the first place. If we've got land which is high carbon stock, we want to leave it as high carbon stock and not convert it for agricultural purposes. And that's really what the third objective is. So in terms of criteria to deliver on those objectives for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, there are two options available to users. One, you can demonstrate that you're employing a list of best practices uh, that the, the TEG determined, uh, they're on the next slides, so we'll talk about them in detail, but determined make a substantial contribution to reducing emissions. Or you can more directly have done a greenhouse gas assessment and demonstrate over time that you're gonna substantially reduce your emissions off the farm by a certain percentage. And the documentation specifies what that percentage should be and it scales over time. So if let's say it's a 10 year investment, it's actually a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions you need to meet. If it's a 20 year investment, it's a 30% reduction and it's obviously lower percentages. The idea being that if you're locking capital up for longer periods, the emission reduction you need to deliver is larger. Um, the second one about maintaining or increasing uh, existing carbon stocks is very similar in that you can either demonstrate you're employing the best practices that are specified that again have been uh, from a review of the scientific literature and talking to the experts are the practices which should enable you to store significant amounts of carbon and in increase the amounts of carbon being stored in biomass and soils or you can do a greenhouse gas assessment and show that you're increasingly sequestering carbon over time measuring greenhouse gas sequestration is actually a lot more difficult than measuring emissions reductions and the time frame is a lot longer to store carbon than it is to stop uh, emitting carbon so the requirements here are a bit more generic and that you basically have to show over a 20-year period that you're steadily increasing your carbon stocks and we haven't put any um, target it's not like we're saying you have to increase by 10 percent 20 percent etc because it's so variable from location to location depending on the soil type how much carbon you've already got stored etc it's really inappropriate to set any sort of absolute target on that sequestration so all you really need to do there is to be measuring and showing that you're in, you're increasing your sequestration over that so, long term so, so that's actually a pretty easy one if you can do that right it's simply a matter of getting people in the habit of measuring and confirming it's not a tough one as long as you're in the ma maintaining. That's it. That's exactly. important to note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the third one is um, there's sort of more technical language on the land use conversion bit. We've borrowed from EU Red 2 uh, 
um, the renewable energy directive there um, where they've got requirements about not converting high carbon stock land which they define more precisely including things like forests and the peatlands that I've mentioned and other high carbon stock land and you cannot have done that at any time since 2008 so this is a little bit retrospective um, on the basis that actually we've known for quite a long time that we really shouldn't be converting high carbon stock land so it isn't okay if you did it last year and yep. suddenly you're green. We actually, we look backwards a little bit here in consistent with other EU legislation that already exists, basically. That's the third that, criteria. That's quite important for some of our emerging market um, uh, colleagues that are on this call in terms of understanding. So establishing the, the timeline is actually a critical part of uh, qualifying in this area, which yep. can be done, but it's a bit of extra work that maybe people consider normally. Yeah. Okay. And, and, this, and the sort of information that you might use to demonstrate that is sort of satellite images or photography or something like that can just basically show the land cover or the land use type over time, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Luckily, we've got a lot of satellite imagery over the last <laughs> 10 years, much yeah. better than, the, than 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess LED this applies in forestry too, these kinds of um, means of assessing what's there. Yeah. Excuse me, Anna, if I just check with Elodie if there's anything she wants to add here. But this, we're going to get into more detail in a minute. But is this correct? Similar kinds of tools required or useful? Yeah, I think for forestry, we have a for measurement of carbon. I mean, we, we're using pretty much the same uh, method as in agriculture, with in the sense that we don't have, we haven't set specific targets uh, for, for improvement of sequestration, of maintenance of sequestration, but it's based on self established baselines. It's based on measuring above ground carbon, which um, with very simple, you know, um, growth yield curves that can be, um, that can be, uh, so the calculations are already in use, especially in, in, in the forest industry. And for reporting data and in terms of, um, you know, doing it and getting the data out there, um, there are satellites, of course, and, you know, this is how LULUCF reporting and, you know, national uh, systems sort of function at a very large scale level, but in terms of the forest taxonomy, because we measure that at the forest stand level. We we want to encourage forest owners and managers to um, to, to have a baseline in place and to measure progress over time. Mm. Um, so there is also a bottom up um, feed of information that you know forests foresters essentially should get to investors. And 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 for that purpose, there are many different frameworks, national frameworks, landscape areas, and frameworks that uh, can be used. We allow for anything that already exists. Uh, but, but the bottom-up um, part is, is also um, um, important in the forest taxonomy. So, uh, um, for both of you, but, but back to Anna, our primary concern, everyone needs to understand on this call, is around the maintenance and improvement of carbon stocks and GSG reductions. And then there are other things that we're looking at as well, but that's our primary filter. For some people in the agricultural space, this is new because um, there have been all sorts of issues that have been trying to address for agriculture, right? But that's the key thing people need to take away from this. Is that right? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our task was to set substantial contribution to mitigation. So we were mm -hmm. really looking at um, criteria that assess exactly emissions and sequestration like I say it's a really unique sector agriculture for the sequestration angle as well and we did we have looked at um, there's a lot of certification schemes in agriculture obviously the round tables of various crops and commodities we look we have looked at a lot of those previously but they've dealt with sustainability more broadly water use biodiversity uh, social issues local community impacts um, health issues from pesticides etc um, so they've got a really wide remit which is fantastic but they've actually not had such a high remit in terms of um, targets for tackling emissions or sequestration so that's why we've had to do something a little bit new and different here um, for this mitigation uh, goal essentially yeah in terms of your backward looking avoiding deforestation was there a reason we chose specific reason we chose one january 2008 yeah it's a really difficult one because a lot of different like i say a lot of these other schemes that exist have dates that this concept of having a backward looking date is nothing new but all the different schemes have a different date um so fsc and uh, the forestry side for LED is 2004, I think. The round tables for agricultural commodities have a range from the early 2000s to 2010, slightly higher. So it's a little bit of an arbitrary decision. So we went with the EU Red 2 because it's already pretty well embedded in EU policy. So we thought it was consistent to use here. And obviously the Red 2 is about um, bioenergy, but it is about agricultural crops that are being used for bioenergy. So it does have some crossover, but that's essentially why we picked it. And 
we could have picked a different date and it wouldn't be really any more right or wrong from a scientific point. It, it is just about a retrospective look to make sure that people have, are not producing on land that really we should have left alone in the first place. Mm. Okay. And if I can, if I can add mm. on to that, for forestry, it's we're using the same date, two thousand eight, which is from the recast of the the renewable energy directive, as Anna mentioned. And indeed, it's different from what FSC and PFC might use um, in you know in their certification schemes, but also so, so what are other... FSC and PFC? Uh, I wouldn't recall Forest exactly. Stewart, no, sorry, sorry, FSC, no, the name. Forest FSC, stewardship. So, so just explain what they are. Forest yeah. stewardship council. The two forestry industry certification schemes, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. That, uh, that monitor sustainable forest management practices essentially across uh, different types of lands and forests. And um, I think FSC was 2014, but I would have to check. And PFC was another one, uh, 2009 maybe. Um, and we chose, base, we chose the EU legislation as, as baseline, also across the, the taxonomy criteria, which right. is 2008. So just to be clear for our listeners, we are talking about the European Union taxonomy and the recommendations that we published early in March for the European Commission to take into their, to affect their regulation that they have agreed to bring in. In fact, the European Council reiterated at a meeting a couple of weeks ago that uh, the regulations are going ahead exactly as expected. We expect the regulation to come into force as a voluntary tool in the quarter four of this year. Uh, the implementation is progressive. By the end of 2022, this European taxonomy will become a mandatory reporting framework for uh, investors, corporations, and we expect banks in Europe, the European banking authority is still drafting that regulation. Uh, Elodie might want to comment on that. The key point is, is that all the disclosure uh, regulations that are coming in, the climate risk disclosure, sustainability disclosure, need to reference the taxonomy. The green bond standard needs to reference the taxonomy and so on. So this is a key underpinning of regulatory settings in Europe for the future around sustainable finance. If you are going to have a sustainable finance product in the market, like a fund or a bond, you will need to reference the taxonomy and reference these land use criteria. So just to be clear, but it's not final yet. We've made our recommendations. The commission will need to do some tidying up. There are a few modest areas in some sections that need further elaboration between now and the bringing of the regulation. So there'll be a few changes, but we have been uh, led to understand that all our substantial recommendations uh, will be adopted. So what you're hearing today is a discussion about the substantial regulations. Uh, you can expect that all of these will be in place in regulation in quarter four next year you know, subject to some kind of crazy political developments. Back to you, Anna, just to take us through this. Anything else on the, on the uh, objectives and more to the point, the criteria that you want to alert us to that we need to understand? Um, I think maybe the only point on this slide to fully bring out is we, you've got options here on the criteria for particularly for the ongoing land use aspects, the reducing emissions and increasing sequestration. You can either demonstrate you're employing the best practices or you can go down the more greenhouse gas accounting route and demonstrate that you're reducing emissions, increasing sequestration. And it's up to the user to choose. And we did that to give flexibility here. Some people will already be up to speed and will have been doing greenhouse gas accounting for a while. Great. You might want to use that route it's probably simpler in the long run to do that other people haven't done that or they actually are working with a lot of um, farm management plans anyway looking at their best practices in which case you can use the best practices route but it's there's no restrictions on who should use which which approach it's entirely flexible okay thank you very much so there are options folks we've had one question for example do you use satellite imagery for soil what we've identified is two ways you can do it. You will need to figure out what is the best way to prove adherence to the taxonomy or with the support of verifiers. But we're not mandatory independent review for the purpose of disclosure, are we? I mean, that is the green bond standard. If you're doing a green bond, you'd have to have a mandated independent reviewer. But for disclosure purposes by investors, the key point is a statement of compliance to provide some evidence of how to do it. Is, that, is it as simple as that, Elodie? So I think for, I mean, on, on forestry, um, for example, I, I mentioned the GHG balance, uh, balance baseline, right? That can mm -hmm. be self-established. Um, because, because it is self-established, 
um, you know, we, we in the taxonomy and the tag uh, recommended that it is verified by the, a third party. So this is something the investors okay. should, should look um, after. Now, as you mentioned, at the end of the day, those criteria is gonna, are going to be put into law mm -hmm. by the European Commission. And so the third party verification aspect of it is uh, also going to have to be discussed by the Commission and, and with the relevant parties in terms of how they'd like to take this forward or how they might want to provide guidance on what third party verification uh, might look like. But for what the TEG has um, recommended, uh, what is self-established should be verified by third party verification um, or, or relevant authorities. So where you have national authorities um, that can monitor um, or you know, certify that your baseline is, is appropriate, um, that counts as well. Ah, okay. So again, there are options here. Absolutely. Important to understand. And Anna, do you want to add to that at all in terms of our conception here? Is that is it different in the agricultural area? Yeah, ours is similar as well. We do want people to have them audited in some way, not necessarily by a big full auditor in a formal sense, but there's some degree of assessment going on um, around the, the accuracy of the, the information. I mean, it's, it's difficult. I mean, one thing about the agricultural criteria and probably the forestry as well is, and, and the agricultural sector, it's not just an emissions profile. There, was not, there is not a good, strong data set out there to set emissions right. threshold targets like in the other sectors that somebody could just use a simple tool and say well here's my and below x grams per unit of production it just we would like to do that it would be probably the most straightforward and it's a very level playing field then but we don't have the underlying data sets to benchmark in that way um, so we are having to be quite um, descriptive in the criteria here um, and quite subjective to all the diversity of different agricultural situations and so that does give a lot it, it's the positive is it gives a lot of leeway for users but the negative is for people that are relying on that information it would be difficult to say how credible or not some of this relatively subjective information is so we have made a recommendation that there is some sort of auditing of the information that you're providing um, okay thank you months. i hope yeah. that's clear for everyone on the call let's have a look at the best some of the best practices discussion that you've had and the guidance you're giving yeah, so this is just a summary of for each of those three uh, activities that we're covering the nature of the best practices. These, these are the categories. Some of these categories have one best practice in them, some have two or three. Um, so there's more than seven best practices. Uh, essentially, the perennial and the non-perennial are very, very similar. I'll just point out a couple of differences. So essentially, they cover um, crop choice and cover or the alternative or the equivalent in the non-perennials is crop choice and rotation. So that's really about trying to stabilize the soil um, and, and soil management a lot to some extent through the crop choice and the cover and the rotation that we're using and not extracting too many nutrients from the soil all those kind of things are covered there soil management is more generally around um, uh, soil compaction and tillage those kind of issues to make sure again you're not disturbing the the sequestration in the soil unduly necessarily. Uh, nutrient management is around fertilizer use and fertilizer ac application effectively, um, which mm -hmm. is obviously a, quite a source of um, emissions in the agricultural sector. Structural elements is, uh, it's around kind of the, the features on the landscape that might serve for mitigation purposes. So trees and woody elements or hedges, et cetera, and maintenance of those um, and not converting those unnecessarily for agricultural area. Um, but actually maintaining them for mitigation purposes. Uh, waste management is really about minimizing um, losses uh, in the production system on the farm. Obviously, the more energy you put and the emissions you associate with producing crops, if that's just wasted before you can get off the farm, that's already lost emissions. That because we because we've, got a, we've got a huge wastage problem in the whole supply chain, right? This is one of yeah. the areas where we can make significant gains. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So this just tackles it on the farm. All of these criteria probably showed at the beginning relate to the farm level itself. We're not looking beyond that at the moment to the broader supply chain aspects. Uh, energy management is just really for some activities. And actually, this is more true in livestock. Um, potentially some uh, agricultural activities will use a lot of energy. So greenhouses in colder climates, for example, mm -hmm. um, or dairy sheds, if you're having to keep animals warm. So some of them could be very high energy use. So we've also got some best practices around the energy management system. Um, and then lastly, this might seem a bit contradictory to what I've said before, but farm 
greenhouse gas assessments. In a sense, this is a bit of the, the outlier here because this is not a best practice which will deliver mitigation. We decided to put this in. It's a very, very rudimentary um, requirement to do some sort of greenhouse gas assessment that does not require auditing in this case, but really it's an attempt to start moving people towards doing greenhouse gas assessments, um, partly for the experience and the capability and development of the tools, partly to build up the sort of data sets that we need to, to be able to improve the situation in agriculture. But it's, this is at no way near the level of um, depth that is required if you're following the other route uh, to compliance with the criteria. Hence, it's just done as a very light touch uh, best practice. The only additional one on the non-perennial crops is uh, there's three best practices relating to paddy rice management. Obviously, that's a very different agricultural system. So um, there's something there about the shallow flooding, for example, um, and a couple of others to do with best practices if you're doing uh, rice. And then uh, livestock management, different entirely. A lot of it is about animal health. The longer your animals live and are healthy, the, the less emissions from animals getting to a productive age and then dying early. Um, Fairly very, fit, common, uh, common sense, really. Yeah, That's exactly. It, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, animal feeding is, um, uh, well, actually something that went in here as a result of the public consultation, one element in the animal feeding is around the embedded emissions in the feed that they're using for animals. Um, right. so we're now accounting for that as well. Um, manure management is obviously, there's a lot of emissions associated with the, the manure from the animals themselves. So there's a few best practices around um, how to manage the manure. Uh, maintaining permanent grassland, uh, if, if you've got it on your livestock, uh, production unit. Um, soil management, again, if you've got some of these, some livestock um, farms or units do have grassland and uh, associated activities on the land. So hence they're similar, these categories are similar to what you see in the crops, some don't. So these are kind of optional. Energy use, again, like I've mentioned, and a rudimentary greenhouse gas assessment um, is the same as the others as well. We have it's very difficult in agriculture because there's such diversity in the way that it's practices in different locations, uh, mm. different biophysical features, etc. So what we've done here is try to put down the set of best practices, which are, we believe, scientifically robust, really do as a bundle, make a substantial contribution to um, mitigation. We don't want people to cherry pick these. In theory, you should be doing all of them. Some of them might be completely inappropriate. I mean, there's obvious ones. If you don't grow rice, then paddy rice management is not going to be relevant to you. If you're livestock and you don't grow your own uh, grass, um, or you don't have anywhere to put the fertilizer, you sell it onto somebody else, it's not going to apply to you. So there is a there is a caveat here that if something is obviously not applicable. will be used globally or available to be used globally um, in the bond market. They are very similar to these. The wording is a little bit different, but we think they map pretty um, straightforwardly to these categories. And we've had a lot of feedback globally, um, including from China, from Brazil, from New Zealand, a lot of different um, agricultural systems. And that, ha that feedback has been supportive. So the text view was that these were globally applicable. The subsequent work that CBI has done in our own global criteria support that as well. So we had a lot of feedback in the public consultation within the EU that some of these weren't applicable in different uh, mm. uh, regions in the EU. So by extension, there will always be areas where they are or aren't more appropriate. But in a basic principle, yes, we do think they are. So, so do, you, do you expect more elaboration of the best practices as we look more closely at different regions and specific needs? Yeah, potentially we did. I mean, again, referring back to CBI's consultation, we did get approaches from people saying ah, there's a kind of similar list that is already um, in legislation or guidance in country X. And people actually came to us with specific examples. Um, they're not actually that detailed yet, not detailed as these best practices. But I can see over time that one thing that would be good is where individual countries or uh, zones within a country actually have their very context specific best practices and guidance on those that could be incorporated into this and i think that was another of the recommendations we made to the platform to monitor that to see how this and 
in essence, one of the other recommendations of the platform was that all the, the agricultural certification schemes and the round tables I mentioned earlier, we would in a way like those to be proxy indicators. This, this is in a sense a first stab at the underlying criteria. The more that we can have uh, regu other regulation or um, industry certification schemes that effectively embed these criteria with tweaks to their context, fine, that that can be used as a proxy indicator. That will be the ideal, the ideal scenario, I think, um, over time. So that's, again, something that we've asked that the platform keeps an eye on. And it will require a lot of engagement um, between different regulatory units and industry certification schemes, et cetera. But I think that's the way forward to make this uh, a lot more consistent and easy to deploy in a lot of different locations. Folks on the call, I haven't told Anna yet, but I need to invite her to a call about Columbia and applying this net we're having next week. Um, to have this conversation, because there's a case study there is, do we need to add more best practices in the Colombian circumstance to make it work or not? So it is a live question. Yeah. The key point for people on the call is that there will be continuing work and continuing examination in this area. This is a starting point. We think it's a solid, substantive starting point to make this work. It doesn't mean that the work is over. And that also means where there are people who have ideas for how to take it forward, there will be some scope in further public consultations in the future for the European taxonomy next year to be able to put input into these kinds of things. And there will be scope to do this at a different country level, especially for those governments that decide to be involved in the European Union's led international platform on sustainable finance, we should be looking at this. We need to, do, to look at forestry, which is also critically important, but I just have one last question. So pesticides, someone has asked, what are we saying about pesticides? Do we say anything? Is it relevant? And other kinds of environmental issues beyond just mitigation and so on, because there's a few that start coming in. Yeah, that, they're all, all those other aspects are uh, addressed in the do no significant harm criteria. So pesticides uh -huh. are addressed as an example. I think that's under pollution control possibly um, is where that went in. But yeah, so water management, uh, pollution control slash pesticides, um, uh, biodiversity and uh, healthy ecosystems uh, and circular economy as well. So all of that is covered in the do no significant harm. Having said that, in some sectors, it might be relatively easy to separate all those impacts out. In agriculture, obviously, it's not. And when we were trying to develop these criteria, even though these are headline criteria for mitigation, it's such an integrated um, mm. sector where what you do in terms of how you use the land has multiple impacts in many ways. We were really mindful of trying not to suggest anything for mitigation that might undermine another goal itself directly. So we've tried to take a fairly balanced view. Um, so none of these things should really be undermining any of the other goals, but there are formal do no significant harm criteria to ensure that. And those criteria are often based on existing EU regulation. They're written in kind of layman's terms, trying to describe the outcomes that we're seeking. Mm -hmm. um, and then where we can, we cross-reference, for EU users at least, cross-reference to um, EU regulation, including the CAP um, and the post-2020 version of the CAP that's currently being worked on. We've tried to reference to that as well. Um, uh, the Water Directive, uh, sustainable pesticides use, etc. all those kind of things are, are covered there. Thank you. And biodiversity conservation is also mentioned there. LED in the forestry area, is that right? And do no significant harm? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and it's part of uh, the environmental risk management processes and systems that um, we have uh, to establish for, um, for, for the farm at the farm level, for culture, but also for forestry. Um, okay. On the biodiversity and pollution, where, where, where that lends. But same for pesticides. It's under so, so, the pollution. So people should look at the do no significant harm provisions if they're interested in those issues, just what you said, because there's quite a lot of discourse in there about these potential other issues that need to be addressed within an overarching framework of carbon. But in forestry, reality, tell us, what have we got covered here? Um, yeah, so um, forestry. So it's the other uh, part of you know, the land use taxonomy. Um, we, it's a, it's a key pillar in the, in the mitigation taxonomy in the sense that it's about keeping carbon stocks, it's about sequestrating more. It's, it's really the net positive contribution to the mitigation mm. taxonomy. It's about making sure that there is a net, in fact, the positive net uh, included. Um, and, and forests are good for carbon reasons, but you mentioned biodiversity and diagnosing even harm, but they also regulate ecosystems. They're part of the carbon cycle. 
Um, and, and the forest industry um, plays also an important part in driving sustainable circular growth. And so it was important to make sure that forestry is included in uh, a finance taxonomy. Uh, interestingly, and, and that's just a parenthesis, but the first thing that comes into mind when you think about climate change and forestry, it's, you know, that de deforestation is responsible for the vast majority of, of carbon emissions. And so um, our taxonomy uh, forest activities are about making a substantial contribution to sequestrating. But of course, deforestation is, um, you know, highlighted everywhere in the taxonomy um, as, as, as a big risk and obviously um, prohibited along the UN Red Guiding Principles. So that's, that's the point. Um, the, the why forests are important. So, so in Europe, they cover about 45% of the European landmass. Um, EU forests make about 20% of the global forest carbon sink. And Sorry, yet, EU, yeah. 20%? That's big. 20%. It's I, would have thought it was all, I thought it was all in Siberia. I know, but but and, okay. and but the thing is, that's very interesting. If, it is interesting. But if you if we want to achieve a net zero target by 2050 in Europe and globally, forests are going to need to sequester even more, right? So so 20. So we need afforestation, is, is what you're saying. So we need to plant a lot of new trees, and also mm -hmm. we need to manage forests better, and we need to be able to measure that um, over time as well, because at the moment it's really complicated to measure carbon mm -hmm. sequestration progress in in the forest. Um, industry so so the the and, and now if i go to to the the scope and and the activities that are covered on under the forest taxonomy um um the, the scope just like agriculture is about um you know a, a criteria that apply to the farm here um we talk about activities that that happen up to the forest gate so that happen in the forest it's about how the forest again and the land are being managed and so the forest taxonomy includes five activities afforestation so that is about planting new trees um, rehabilitation and restoration of forests um, reforestation it's planting trees on previous forest land um, mm -hmm. and we've also sort of invented uh, the fourth activity which is existing forest management so I'm, I'm going to come back to this one and added uh, conservation forestry um, after the, the the public consultation period that took place last year um, so so those activities they uh, fall under a nice category that Anna mentioned in the beginning this EU classification system of economic activities um, that is named forestry and logging so logging is included here as full part of the economic life cycle of, of the forest um, and, and, and those activities have been chosen to go all the way from when we plant the trees up to when we, we harvest them, right? Um, but, but you mentioned gate, can you explain what that means up to the gate? So it means that we don't um, make a, a recommendations in terms of the end use of how the, the, the wood uh, might be processed uh, after it's been harvested, so after it's, it's left uh, the forest land essentially. Um, ah, so does that mean gate. that if you're building timber houses in Sweden, you don't count that as part of your assessment of the sustainability of the forest? Is that, is that kind of what it means? Because you can't be sure of how that timber is being used? So the forest owner cannot know how it how the wood is being used. Um, this, right. I mean, we we try all that and we tried um, to to figure out how that could work. And I'm, I I'm, I can come back to this. Um, okay. But the, if you have a, a Swedish, um, uh, you know, construction uh, company, uh, the supply of the wood has to be taxonomy compliant. If um, it, you know, f from from the from the building perspective, and you can find that criteria actually in the building taxonomy. Um, Good point. But in it's fact, not we mandate. I think we mandate eighty percent has to be FSC or PEFC compliant. Yep. Exactly. So we actually use a proxy, which is FSC and PFC for now because uh, it's unlikely that uh, you will have so many forests that uh, comply with the three criteria straight from next year. So for now we use FSC and PFC, um, but ultimately the objective will be that um, taxonomy compliant buildings and houses uh, will have to supply over time wood from taxonomy compliant forests. Um, for now it's using um, proxies, yes. Um, and um, okay. let, let, I've lost the start of what, what, uh, my... Sorry, yeah. uh, I was going to suggest why don't we go into the detail, that was the previous slide. Yeah. Why don't we go into the detail now of how this works? Um, sure, so 
there, there are essentially um, three cumulative, cumulative criteria that cuts across the, the five activities. They, they vary at, at the margin, essentially, but so mostly they're a, a mix of qualitative and quantitative criteria, fairly similar to those that you can find in the agricultural taxonomy that Anna just described. Um, the first criteria is about applying sustainable forest management practices. Um, that builds on the definition from Forest Europe and on existing frameworks, existing definitions of what sustainable forest management is. Um, we're also providing an annex to the taxonomy document that is online, uh, a number of um, practices with most potential, so they are recommended practices in essence, um, with most potential to increase the carbon stocks across the different carbon pools. Um, and similar to the agricultural taxonomy criteria, I, I mentioned earlier, we use a principle of no conversion of lens that has uh, had a heart governed stock status since 2008. So that's the same criteria as, as, as in agriculture. That first criteria, sustainable forest management is fairly known to EU forest managers. It should be relatively straightforward to everyone. We haven't invented anything there. Um, the second criteria is about measuring carbon uh, above ground carbon. Um, this is less common to uh, the business of forest management. Um, we, we yet there, there are best practices out there that you know that um, 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 show that this is possible and to, to do it. Um, we thought having carbon measurement is so it's so important to initiate as we race towards uh, net zero. Mm -hmm. um, and so so forest owners and managers are required by the second criteria to, as I mentioned earlier, establish a, a greenest gases binding baseline at the mm -hmm. beginning of the economic activity. Um, based on, as I said, growth yield curves. The taxonomy provides the calculation of that. I, I don't have it you know, at the top of my head, but it's fairly easy to establish. Uh, as, as mentioned, it can be self-established, um, provided it is verified by, by a third party. Um, and the third criteria um, relates to the first two. Um, so it's about demonstrating permanence of sustainable forest management um, that is crucial from a sequestration perspective, but also from a biodiversity and, and from a soil quality perspective, sustainable forest management is really a, a holistic uh, approach to forest management. Um, and so demonstration of, of SFM, of permanence of SFM, but also performance in carbon sequestration. So essentially what criteria three is about is that forest owners and managers um, should establish a forest management plan. Most of them already have one in, in Europe um, and they should disclose how they're progressing at 10 years intervals. 10 years is a, forests have long life cycles, but 10 years is, is, is a long period of time. Um, it, it aligns with uh, management cycles and, and time horizons that are performed um, in the EU already, notably the, the national forest inventories that are in place, use 10 years as, as a reporting um, timeline. Um, and, and those plans should also enable investors confirm that criteria one and two are implemented and, and monitored over time. So that's, you, you that's how you, we... Yeah. You've mentioned long time frames here. And of course, what this raises for me is adaptation and resilience issues as well. In, you know, Anna, can I ask you, you, you've done a lot of the leading the work in adaptation and resilience. So we do have some do no significant harm requirements in agriculture and in forestry. Can you tell people what we're looking for there? How do we address that issue? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, the. The EU taxonomy, the work that was done on adaptation and resilience and the resulting criteria around those actually applied to all of the activities. That it's the same set of criteria that apply to all activities across the taxonomy. So it's the same for agriculture, forestry, hydropower, uh, bioenergy, et cetera, et cetera. So in, our, in general then, the, the requirement for adaptation and resilience for these activities is that the activity itself is resilient to climate change. That's really what we'd want to see. It's very difficult to say what you should do to make it resilient to climate change, because obviously it depends on where you are, what climate risks you're facing, what the best uh, way is to address that in your particular context um, is so subjective and context specific. And for that reason, the mm -hmm. adaptation resilience criteria for agriculture and forestry and everything else is process based. 
it essentially requires you um, to have done a risk assessment of what your climate risks are, your, your two physical climate risks, so weather related, acute and chronic, um, so things like floods, well particularly relevant I think for agriculture and forestry, um, temperature changes, extreme, extreme weather events, um, droughts or floods, those kind of activities, but it specifies in the taxonomy the list of physical climate risks that you need to be at least considering to see whether they are a substantial risk to your operations. So you do an assessment, work out which are your material risks, um, and then you work out a plan to say, how am I going to address those material risks um, effectively? Uh, and you implement that plan over time. It's as simple as that, in essence. And you continually monitor as well, because obviously climate change is accelerating, effects are popping up all the time. Something that you thought was the best thing to do two years ago might not be the best thing to do in five years time. So there is a kind of continual monitoring and re-evaluation around this so that you're always aware of what the risks are looking forward over quite a long period of time and you're adapting to that and putting the measures in place to address that essentially. Whatever that is, it could be things like drought resistant crops as a good example in agriculture and, and forestry as well potentially or wind resistant for forestry something or uh, break measures if there's going to be increasing forest fires but it really depends on where you are and the risks that you're facing what you will actually do to address it. So it's not that hard, but you've got to do it, is what you're saying. There's work yeah, to be done, but we're not setting exactly. a, a tough bar on the criteria. The key no, thing exactly. is that you do the yeah. process. You do the process. And if people are not used to doing this process, they're not alone. Because one thing that we're finding in the adaptation resilient space is people are not really doing this in a particularly thorough way consistently yet um, across all sorts of sectors and scales, large and small scale. Um, so it is going to be a learning curve for everybody to do this, I think. And um, when we were developing the agriculture part of the taxonomy, there was a lot of people asking for, well, just tell me the 10 or 20 or 30 investments that you can say, well, these are definitely resilience investments. It just doesn't work like that. So there's a lot of education and learning to do in this space anyway. Yeah. Okay. So uh, important point, important point for everyone to note about this. Um, it's in, in, a, in a way, it's another transition, isn't it? We're trying to transition the sector to start considering adaptation and resilience. And so we're asking for process requirements as you think from key metrics for whether it's a good enough process. We're not going to do that now. And we might improve that over time. As, as the knowledge increases, as the practice increases, we'll have a chance to have greater definition about what's got to be involved. But we've got yes. to start. Uh, I know we've got to lose Anna in a couple of minutes because she's doing another webinar on, uh, around uh, environmental issues like this. Um, so I just want to thank you, Anna, for, in case you have to drop off your call when you do okay. this. I want to go back to forestry because we're drilling down into this. So. Um, Elodie, you've had a lot of conversations with the plantation industry, the applicability in Finland, Scandinavia, in general, Poland, and so on. Where has this got to? How does this work for a small landholder, a small forest family in um, Finland? What the, what, what's the practical implication? Hmm. So, I mean, we, we um, one thing to note is forestry is fairly complex in the sense that um, there is no such thing as forest regulation at the EU level, right? So it's in the competence of member states. So each country in Europe, and essentially each country in the world, has its own uh, regulatory framework and way of functioning, right? When it comes to uh, uh, assessing uh, how sustainable forest management is, um, is, is being processed and, and how carbon can be reported. So we've had to look into different countries and, and, and type of uh, market structures. Finland is indeed one, one complex um, um, uh, case where it's, it's a very fragmented um, country with a lot of different forest owners. And so um, we, we had to address this question indeed um, uh, throughout the process. At the end of the day, um, the, the responsibility lies at, at the at the forest stand level, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's the base for, for the taxonomy. Now, of course, um, it's it's not easy to report data and to measure carbon when, when you just have a, a couple of hectares, or you know, and and you for and, and for example, when you, you your land is part of a, of a broader landscape of a, of a sourcing area for for timber, um, and so taxonomy allows again for um, a very wide range of measurement and reporting. 
uh, framework and practices to be to be uh, used so that forest owner in Finland then only have a couple three four hectares of forest um, that lends you know it's uh, the, the the use of the land to a, a, a bigger producer or a bigger manager uh, can of course use um, higher uh, scales and, and level frameworks to, to report data um, uh, as such. So we, we okay. have, um, yeah, so we've made sure that th this is possible, yeah. So, so what you're saying, it is possible because you, you remember some of the early conversations, there was a, a mild terror amongst the, uh, the forestry industry in Scandinavia that are going to be excluded. That's not the case, but there are processes and there are reporting is required to make it work. Is that my yeah. understanding? It's your understanding. And there's a, a question also about monoculture is, and this was something that the Finnish industry also came back to us about, you know, yeah. whether monocultures are included in, in the taxonomies and where, you know, uh, a lot of very similar trees are, are, are being planted in, in, um, in, in Finland. And so the, the final recommendation of, of the TEG was um, not to exclude monocultures from the uh, from the taxonomy. However, you can find in the ecosystem and biodiversity do no significant harm uh, requirements to promote close to nature forestry or similar concepts depending on the local requirements and, and limitations of, of the land. And also you find requirements around the selection of native species, um, all varieties, ecotypes, um, that adequately provide uh, the necessary resilience to climate change, nat natural disasters, and all the things that Anna just mentioned about uh, resilience and adaptation. So we don't exclude monoculture, but we want to make sure that the trees are native and um, and that there is a, a careful attention put to um, uh, close to nature forestry type of uh, concepts and principles. Because this supports biodiversity in particular and other measures. Exactly, so, and the management so, of ecosystems. Yeah. So a eucalypt forest in Provence would not be in, does that mean? Could not be done, included? Um, typically, if it's not a native, uh, if it's not, no, obviously, a uh, important would not be native, but um, <laughs> exactly, no, indeed, that, that, would, uh, that would have to be justified under the adaptation taxonomy, and so you would have had to put in place a, a, a good risk management process and establish that this is providing specific resilience add on ah. um, to, to forestry. So you could find a way to put that in, but you, you would also have to make sure that you're not endangering uh, biodiversity and ecosystem at the same time. So I guess, you know, the balance, uh, it, it, the, the result would lie in, in the balance of how much risk you're creating on biodiversity versus how much resilience you're creating. So that's great. That's very interesting. So really you, you've got to think these things through and there is scope. In fact, you need to be looking for how your landscape's going to change based on changing rainfall patterns and weather patterns in the coming in the future as you make these assessments right and um, exactly. that might lead to things that people don't think is obvious now but Provence is not going to look the same in 2040 unfortunately where we're going and actually on on this point one one small point really when we're talking about resilience we don't want people to be just looking over the life of a financial instrument we want them to be looking over the life of the asset or the activity good point um, uh, yeah, so that's a big thing. If you've got a three-year bond, it's not enough to just think about resilience over the next three years. So we're looking more like 20-year horizons in terms of our justifications here. Is that the sort at of least. thing you look at least? At so well, some, well, for water infrastructure, you'll be looking at possibly 100 years, for example. So agriculture, forestry, quite long time frames. Mm. Um, even some, some renewable energy, 20, 30 years. So yeah, it's not short. Mm. Uh, for forestry specifically, and I think, you know, I'll hand over to you then, Sean, but for forestry, we, uh, we've established that performance on carbon sequestration would have to be established uh, after 20 years for afforestation. Uh, this is essentially, uh, you know, Lulu CF accounting rules uh, to change from afforestation to forest land. And so mm. when you plant trees on, on a land that wasn't forest before, you have to demonstrate performance over 20 years. It's fairly straightforward, you know, trees grow and sequester carbon anyway. Um, but you also have to demonstrate that you've uh, managed that afforestation according to sustainable forest management, um, sustainable, forest, sustainable forest management principles uh, for, <laughs> um, voilà, for uh, existing forest management, however. And this was also a big question raised from you know, the, the Nordic um, forest managers in, in the industry. Um, we have aligned the, the performance um, limit to the to the, the rotation period of the forest, so to the economic life cycle of the forest, because in Nordic countries you have a lot of um, 
uh, felling practices that are called continuous felling practices where you know carbon goes up and down you know during 80 years because you know sometimes you cut sometimes you harvest uh, while trees continue to grow and so and so we've uh, we've made sure that the performance uh, from a carbon emission perspective can be aligned with the uh, economic life cycle of, of the forest essentially so uh, I'm I, last year before the lockdown I was planning my next holiday in August in, in northern Portugal Olive groves, does that, does that include it here? There's a lot of olive groves around Mediterranean. I mean, when we're talking about that level of plantation forestry, we've been talking about Scandinavian so far. Switch to yeah. Mediterranean or, or other kinds of tree agriculture. How does this fit between the two sets of agriculture? The, sorry, I two sets criteria, the agriculture and forestry criteria. I'm pretty sure they'd be under agriculture, actually, under the okay. perennials. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, all of those yeah. um, oils, um, grapes under uh, agriculture, um, all of those things are under perennials. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when I'm walking through those olive groves, that's what I've got to be looking at in my hand, the taxonomy guide to agriculture. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've got a few questions online, but, but Elodie, do you see this as, um, uh, I mean, you, you've had so many discussions about practicability. Give us a sense now of a likely take up in the industry and going forward. You know, there's been so many conversations, so many consultations. Since the June consultation, you've made some changes. You indicated the inclusion of existing forest management. Mm -hmm. In terms of take up, do you have any views about the, what it's gonna look like in the next couple of years and whether we're gonna see a, a rapid um, usage of these taxonomy? What's your feeling? Hmm. I think um, so. So the investors and banks also are, tri are trialing a lot of them the the, the use of this taxonomy and uh, the there are uh, there is a, a group of uh, investors under the principles for responsible investment that are uh, producing agriculture and forestry case studies and so they're you know they're looking at um, debt and equity portfolios and. Uh, try to understand how this criteria might uh, fit for them. Same for banks. We have a, a group of 25 major European banks that are um, uh, some of them that are going to look at um, forests and agriculture loan books uh, to try to figure out how that works. So I'm, I think the finance industry is 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 starting to uh, to assess how that is going to work for them. Um, early findings show that you know data, uh, finding data and uh, understanding how to grasp and understand and aggregate the data is 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 going to be the primary uh, mm. issue for everyone. Um, the other is the use of proxies. Um, indeed, you know there's, the intention is that uh, this is applied internationally. Agriculture and forestry is, you know, from from a, a carbon emission perspective, is not just relevant for Europe; it's relevant globally. So uh, we we're going to enter a phase of um, comparing the different frameworks, the certification schemes, and, and understand how much um, investors can use um, for, for their assessments. Um, that, that is going to take, for forestry, I can, I can talk about that. Uh, for forestry, I think it's, you know, it's, it's going to be fairly simple and, and straightforward. Um, we estimate that the sustainable forest management and the no significant harm criteria match FSC and PFC uh, certification standards, for example, the, 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 the complication will be more about the conversion, the con no conversion date, 2008, as Anna mentioned, this is a very political um, date, different across countries. So I think, you know, using proxies is, and, and assessing these proxies for practices is going to be fairly straightforward and it's going to happen soon. Measuring carbon uh, and understanding where to get the data um, and how to treat in, uh, the data might take a, a little bit longer um, and, and that's something that the internet uh, the sustainable platform at, uh, of the European Commission is, is going to to um, elaborate on as well. Thank you for that. Anna, from your perspective, the key challenges in making this work going forward, data is clearly one as Elodie said, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think it is going to be I think it's going to be a bit harder in agriculture than it has been for forestry. Some people are already um, doing greenhouse gas accounting, for example. Some people are already, it's not just doing the agricultural best practices, it's showing that you're doing them, um, which is in itself not difficult per se, but actually it's not an established practice at the moment. And because the potential proxies that exist, so LED has already done sort of preliminary looking at the FSC and PFC, and they are two really dominant forestry standards globally. There's a much bigger proliferation in the agricultural sector of these other standards. And um, I think there will be a bit more work to do to kind of align them as proxies. 
um, and see to what extent they do cover off the majority of these criteria or not uh, and use them as proxies. And so I think it might be a bit slow take up. It will obviously be harder for, well, potentially be harder for smaller actors than it will be for larger ones just because of resource question. Um, so that is a consideration as well. Um, but these are good practices. They're good agricultural practices, which should increase uh, yields and productivity and strengthen the resilience of the farm, which is economically beneficial as well. So it's not like they're something that's being asked for, which is detrimental in any way. It's really just getting used to, well, these are what the requirements are on paper. How do I show that I'm meeting that? Or maybe I need to add a couple of best practices that I'm not doing already. Um, so I think it'll be a kind of educational curve to go through here to deploy these kind of um, steps and demonstration. Great point, Anna. Really great point. So we've got a lot to learn about what, are, what is the right kind of farming to suit our future. But the, what is not in doubt is that we must create a more sustainable future. We have to learn from this crisis going forward what that means. We have to use the taxonomy as a framework for the future. Um, it will be a piece of work that we continue to work on, but we've tried to establish here some rule sets which are consistent with what we need to do in the future. And as Anna, say, Anna says, also absolutely consistent with economic sustainability. That's the key point about this. So uh, I hope you will, uh, you've found, got some useful lessons and thoughts from today's webinar. We need to wrap up now. Thank you, Elodie. Thank you, Anna, very much for joining us um, at, uh, on this European afternoon, morning in the US and uh, evening in, in Asia. We've had a lot of people from um, other countries in, on this webinar. We'll now get some questions for you to uh, try and answer later on. This, as I said, is a series. Thursday next week, 1500, another taxonomy webinar, and every Thursday beyond that, and a few others as well. This will be available on YouTube, on Yuku, and as a podcast. So you can check your understanding uh, if you'd like to, or share with other people. Um, please join us in helping make not only Europe, but the planet, more sustainable. That's the mission of what we're trying to do and marry that with sustainable finance. We have the capital, we have the solutions, the procurement plan for the future we have here shows you that. We now just need to get on with doing it. Thank you very much for joining us today, everyone.